Hey guys, how you doing? Jake Estrada here with Indie Originals, and we're talking about comic book distribution. That's right, guys. Comic book distribution. How do you distribute your comic books in this independent world that we live in? Well, you know, let's take a brief look at the background here for independent comics. You know, there's Diamond, there's uh, Comicsology, and doing it yourself. Those are a few ways that people have distributed comics in the last few years. You know. Thinking about myself now, um, from owning a comic shop almost 11 years ago, running it for about a year and managing that, and then eventually just doing away with that and just going back into comic books, making my own stuff, having work in and out of the, the field as a printer, um, have done a lot of different things in the comic industry. So uh, I, I know a few things, and I've done things a lot differently than a lot of other people too. And also failed a lot too. So, you know, I'm just talking from experience. And what works for me may not work for you. But let's just so let's take a further look at comic book distribution in general. You know, this is a broad scope. Let's look back in the in the old days. So um so we're talking about this distribution thing, right? So it started way back before I was even born. You know, comic books have been, especially American comics, have been published over 100 years. You know, it started with Action Comics and um, Detective Comics. And these things were, these comic books were found on, you know, in stores like barber shops and candy shops and grocery stores. You would go into a store and you would see comics on a spinner rack. And you would go, oh, look at this, Amazing Spider-Man 129. Oh, Uncanny X-Men 74, and you will go back the following month, and you may or may not find X-Men 75. You may or may not find Amazing Spider-Man 130, because during these days, it was the distribution model through the newsstands, and this was handled through, you know, news agents, and these guys would fill uh, all the magazines, you know, like from Playboy down to Rolling Stone magazine. They handled all that stuff, and... These guys sold it to the, the vendors and the shops, and they would refill it. So whatever. So if you would go to that shop just to buy that comic, and it may not be there, so you will have to go to another store and hoping they had their own selection of comics, and they may be a month ahead, a month behind. There was no rhyme or reason. They just filled the, the, the racks up, and you got what you got. So that's why a lot of comic books were self-contained stories, one issues, one and done. Because they knew that people wouldn't be able to continue, continuously pick up the stories because of the way the model was designed. So come the 70s, where uh, Phil uh, Sealing of Seagate comic distributors in the 70s built up his own comic book distributor. Because he was a collector, but also he wanted to have a store to sell comic books. That's, and this was the main specialty market for it. And that would become the direct market. This guy walked up to, to uh, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, all the major comic uh, publishers, and told them outright, like, hey, I got uh, a great idea. This is what I want. I want you to sell it to me directly. And it will sell the comics to them directly. And he, he brokered his deal. And this was the birth of the direct market that we know today. Now, it was a lot different, but this was... The birth market. This guy is basically the father of the direct market. So as he came along and he created this, they started to sell all these these comics directly to him. Now, now you're, you're wondering what made the difference between newsstand and the direct market. Well, the newsstand markets, these comic books, like all other magazines and, and, and books and, and things like that, are returnable. So you you know you buy a comic book from this distributor. And after 30 days, 60 days, whatever, whatever terms they set up, you return this publication back to the, the publisher. The only difference is that once you send it back to the distributor, the book could be really beat up. They'll rip off covers, whatever kind of discounts they get, and the percentage was really low. Now, the direct market, you owned all things. None of the books were non-returnable. You would just get the book, and you would outright own it, and you would get a deeper discount. This was a lot more appealing to direct market comic book shops because, you know, they had the whole back market back in the day. The back market was older issues and they would have them in long boxes and people would go to the comic shops 
and pick up a back issue that they were missing that they were looking for for the last five years. I mean, if you're an old school comic collector like myself, I remember having a sheet of paper with issues that I was missing and I would go to these comic shops to pick up older issues. And, you know, back in the day, that was a huge mark markup for comic shops. And that's how they made a lot of their money were on these older issues where they would sell it for a above cover price. So if a book was worth a buck and a book was popular, they might be selling a book for 30, 40, 50 bucks, even more, you know, depending on how rare it was and what kind of character was in it. So, um, Comic shops used to do that a lot before the whole trade paperback industry took over in, in the earlier 2000s. Now, um, so going back to the direct market, th this direct market took the industry by storm, more or less. There was more risk, but much more profit, like I was pointing out. And as Americans, we are capitalists. So, so all these different comic distributors emerged from this. So... There was Seagate, there was Capital City Comic Distributors, there was Diamond Comics, and Heroes World, just to name a few. And soon there were many more. And there were some of them were regional, some of them were, you know, national, but all of them were trying to be global, and they were all looking for their own niche, and they were all looking for their own comic books. And, um, and, and this is how a big boom started for the comic industry, especially in the 70s. It was a huge underground market. It was a huge underground comic industry. This is where guys like Crumb and uh, the Hernandez brothers and, and, Sp and Spain Rodriguez came to be and, and, and these black and white comics were being published and then, and, 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 you know, it took the industry by storm. Comic books were everywhere. And there was all kinds of people distributing comic books everywhere. But as time was going on, these other companies would gobble up these other companies and slowly the companies were getting larger and, and because their, their bottom goal as a distributor, you know, you want to have as much product as you want. You want to diversify your lines. You want to be able to sell all these things and be able to offer all kinds of stuff to your vendors, to your customers. So um, the 80s were a really interesting time, you know, for comic books and publishers. And there was a huge market, you know, there was all these four, four color products and they managed to have market share and, and people were buying these comics, and you know, competition between the direct markets was fearsome. You know, everyone was trying to one up each other. But this competition also allowed for people to to treat their customers better. With competition, it allowed people to come up with better delivery, better options, better discounts, better product lines, better better everything, better customer service. You know, without the competition, you get you know bloated, slow complacent and that's what was good about these distributors you know having so many so many to pick from like if one made you angry or pissed you off you turn to the next guy who probably had the same product line and you're able to deal with him opposed to the other one and th this made things better made things smoother as a, a, a customer now it was co very competitive but you also got to remember a lot of comic book uh, publishers really didn't like sharing their market space with all these other comic books. And, and, and namely, one big comic book publisher really hated this big time. He hated, they hated, not he, I call it he, but it hated sharing market space with all these small fly-by-night self-publishers. They wanted to be the only one. They didn't want a catalog with, with let's just say, like uh, Space Coast Comics next to Wolverine. Oh, no, that was that was too too bad for them. They wanted... They wanted something all of their own. So they carved out their own niche and they defected and they bought up their own um, distributing. Let's guess who I'm talking about. That's right, guys. I'm talking about Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics was like, oh, no, we're too good for our own crap. And we're going to go and we're going to buy our own distributor. So this is roughly at the end of 1994, they bought Heroes World. And Heroes World effectively became Marvel Comics' primary source of way they were going to distribute their comics. And they, they went and they, sh they struck, it, but that shook the industry by the core. This, this made all the other distributors of comic books scared because here they are, they're losing 30, 40% of their business now is, is gone because now Marvel is no longer be di being distributed through their services. It's only being distributed for this one sole publisher. And... You know, 30, 40% of net losses is huge in business. I mean, huge, guys. You got to think about that. If you lost 30, 40% right now, it, it hurts. L look what we're going through right now with this pandemic. You know, industries are losing 
tons of money because they're losing a large percentage. So this was what was happening in, in the mid-90s here, 94, 95. And um, people were scared. And people were, were looking how we're going to survive this. So all these comic distributors between Diamond at this point and Capital City a comic distributor, they got into a, a heated war with each other. They were trying to be, you know, the, the, the sole distributor by picking up all these exclusive contracts with all these different uh, comic publishers. So they went back and forth until ultimately Capital City couldn't keep up and they eventually they sold to Diamond Comics, making Di Diamond Comics the sole exclusive uh, comic distributor besides Heroes World with Marvel. But Marvel was, you know, floundering along and having all kinds of issues. They were having uh, late, late deliveries and they couldn't keep up with the demand. And eventually they too folded and started being distributed by Diamond, thus making Diamond the only comic distributor at this point. By 1997, Diamond Comics was the only comic book distributor of the main published books from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse. You name it, you thought of during that time, Diamond Comics had exclusive contracts with all these guys. Um, and it's kind of funny because that's apparently what the major publishers wanted. You know, they just wanted to have one person that will handle all their, their affairs and make it feel special. And that's what happened. They, they ended up being distributed. And um, people started screaming that, how can this be? Diamond's a monopoly. So, you know, the federal government did look into this. And the federal government did say, in effect, Diamond was a... a a monopoly for comic books, but not for magazines. So that's how Diamond Comics was able to skate by this whole whole thing, because magazines were still being distributed, and comics are basically classified as a magazine. And this is a small niche market where you know someone else can create their own distribution system and distribute comics. It's just they just need to have the time and resources and infrastructure set in place. So. Um, People started looking at Diamond, and, and people started saying, well, there's still a lot of independent creators. So right around that time, uh, FM International stepped up to the plate to deal with all the smaller publishers that were left in the wake of Diamond Comics taking over. So FM at a time was distributing smaller publishers like uh, CrossGen. If you guys remember that, CrossGen was a small publisher out in Tampa, Florida. And this guy was an independent book, but his books were full color, and he spent a lot of money. He was a millionaire. And at one point, he also owned Megacon. And he actually made boosts and everything for CrossGen. And um, he was being distributed through FM International. But he got a, a juicy deal with Diamond. And, and he jumped ship from, with, with Diamond to become exclusive with them. And FM lost out with that. And then one of the most recent publishers to work with FM was IDW. IDW worked for them for a time before they got an exclusive contract with Diamond. This is prior to FM closing up shop in 2005. And once they did that, virtually Diamond again was the only comic distributor and it made it much more difficult for indie guys to even find alternative distributors. Now, um, if you're looking at that, so there's the two main companies you know, that drives our, our, our comic industry. And um, most people, they, they look at Diamond, and uh, not Diamond, uh, DC and Marvel Comics. And, and then you have all the other small, biggest publishers like Image, uh, Dark Horse and all that all being distributed under, under, this, the, under this one guy, under this one company. And I say one guy because this, this is a privately owned company called Diamond Comics by one guy. He owns all this. This is not traded or anything. This guy owns one thing. And if you ever go to, like, Baltimore, he has a, a museum. He has a lot of stuff. I mean, the guy has done a lot of stuff. He has a deep love for comic books. So it's really not his fault. This was brought on by Marvel that, you know, resulted in him being the sole comic book distributor. So, um... Recently, like, I had a touch base about the, the pandemic that we're going through, you know, with this, uh, the COVID-19, or more known in public as the coronavirus. Um, so th this virus has gone, gone across the, the many nations, and, and we're all staying inside. So this, this forced uh, Diamond Comics to shutter their business because a lot of comic shops had closed, and comic shops closed the doors. And as they closed the doors, um, a lot of people... Uh, wouldn't wouldn't venture out anyway, so they weren't really buying comics. So a lot of comic shops are are waiting this out, just like you and me. We're sitting here waiting this out, and um, but DC Comics wasn't having any of that. Just recently, they decided well they were gonna jump ship, create create two or uh, create new contracts with uh, 
Diamond, not Diamond, with uh, Midtown Comics and DCBS. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but anyway, they created two new contracts for brand new uh, distributors to distribute the books. And some people are throwing, you know, a uh, big hissy fit. They're like, oh, no, that's not right. Is DC Comics going crazy? And, you know, I do things in an unfortunate time, and, and, a, and it can come off kind of sneaky to some people. But at the same time, you got to think about, as a comic book publisher myself, having published uh, over 70 titles and, and still in the field, and still uh, uh, creating stuff, and still in thinking about different books I'm going to publish pretty soon, I think is refreshing. You know, it's a fresh of a, 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 a beautiful sunshine, Florida air, you know? And um, you got to think about this, guys. How would you like to live in a world where Walmart controlled everything? Walmart controlled the supermarkets. Walmart was in this big retail war, and Walmart ended up winning. They, 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 they won against uh, McDonald's, Burger King. So everything became Walmart, from fast food to supermarket to retail to, to auto mechanics work. Everything became Walmart, and Walmart controlled all, all that, right? You would go out, and you would look for hamburger. And they're like, oh, no, we don't carry hamburger no more. We carry veggie burgers, veggie burgers. So now you got to eat veggie burgers. So you're, you're eating veggie because we decided beef is bad for you. We, we decided meat is bad for you. They're deciding for you. And they're giving you those, those options. And that's the only options they give you. Because it is, they, they, they decided that they didn't like what the, the meat farmers were, were trying to sell them. And they said, you know, we don't need them. All we tell our people what they're going to get. And then they tell you exactly. So they don't even offer any more, you know, variety. You're just stuck with Walmart. So you no longer get competitive pricing. You no longer have the option of going to uh, Walmart or go to a local mom and pop shop who might offer meat at a, at a discounted price. You know, you're no longer getting any of those options. You're just dealing with the flat price overall everywhere. So no longer are getting competitive price. That's crazy. That's not that's not how America was designed. That's not how our our system is made to be. That actually would make you want to rebel because you don't want to have just one option. You want to have multiple options. So you know, for a comic shop to decide, well, no, I'm just dealing with diamond only, and that's all I want to deal with. That's kind of you know, self self defeating. Self defeating. You know, you're you're letting a, a uh, a sole person, a sole business telling you what to do and you're being dictated by that because you want to be lazy? I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying they're all being lazy. I'm just saying that, that kind of thought pattern is kind of weird. And, you know, and I never quite understood that because, I, like, again, I'm telling you, I ran my own comic shop. And I remember for that year when I ran that comic shop, I, I found it ludicrous that there was only Diamond. And then, you know, on top of only Diamond, there was Alliance Games, which is owned by Diamond. And that's the only people that basically you could get stuff from. And they set the terms, and there was no incentives. There was nothing. There was just diamond, okay? And, and I was like, man, the, 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 this is weird how this got set up. But this was something set in motion way before I got into that game. You know, in 1997, I was only a 19-year-old kid, still with, with my finger up my rear, thinking about stars and flying off and drawing. So, you know, with that being said, I think, you know, as an independent creator, you have to think in alternative models. And one of my alternative models I always suggest to people is that, you know, you need to get out there, you know, promote your product. And one of the many things you need to do, you know, you got to create your own infrastructure because you got to look at it this way. Uh, many book publishers, they create their own infrastructure. Even many book authors like James Patterson, this guy came from a world of uh, 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 graphic design and uh advertising and all that stuff. And he created his own infrastructure. I mean, I've seen this guy make commercials for his own books. And that's what, you know, these book publishers do. They create their own infrastructure. And you, as a comic book creator, you need to create your own infrastructure. You need to see what works for you. I mean, one case in point right now is a, a turn of comics. This comic book uh, publisher decided, you know what, we're dropping out. We're not using Diamond. I created my own, my own model, and I want to make my own sales between all the comic shops that I already have. And I have other models set in place. So with that being said, 
you have to follow that similar model. You have to create your own infrastructure. And you got to use all these systems and all these different distributors. You need to reach out. You need to make phone calls. You need to go to meetings. You need to meet people. You need to shake hands. You need to show your face. You need to talk about it. You need to be proactive. You need to contact these comic shops. If you want to have your books in comic shops, you need to send them some promotional material, be it if it's digital or print some posters. But some comic shops want posters. If you can afford that, send them to them. I, I, I suggest that would be highly, you know, they will like that. But a lot of comic shops, they're not, you know, they don't decline working with independent publishers, but they want to see a face behind this publisher's name. They just don't want to see a fly by night. They want to see your passion. They want to see your love because they're people too. And they're, and they're all out for the bottom line too. And I don't blame them if they don't want to take a book for whatever reason they may have. But you have to do the work and you got to keep on going forward and you need to keep refining your product and you need to keep on working. And this is how you do it. You got to create your own infrastructure. Like, like, I did. I created my own infrastructure. You know, where I live locally, a lot of people know who I am because I created infrastructure for my own books. In fact, I, I went totally different. I went in a totally opposite direction where I was actually releasing my books for free and dropping them off in different locations. But that was me creating a distributing network. I was distributing my books and placing them in places where people could pick them up and read them, and it became available for advertisers and advertiser dollars. So, you know, you got you to gotta look at all that stuff. So, you know, if a monopoly is unwilling to work with you, you don't need to worry about that because you just need to go out and start setting up your own thing. There's digital downloads. There's websites. There's social media. You can use all these forums to promote your product and talk about your product and share it with the world and then, you know, make sales directly. This is even Kickstarter. It helps you fund things and fund your project. And, and you know, there's no, there's no easy way on doing this, but it all requires work. Nothing happens overnight, guys, and you can do this, but you just got to put in the work. Um, furthermore, you know, so I'm telling you as a publisher, you know, you need to go out there and you need to distribute and you need to create a list. Another, another way, another thing to do is you start partnering up with other comic book guys. You start partnering up with friends. You start telling them, look, I got my book and you got your book. Why don't you come with me and I help distribute your, your comic book in my area? And before long, you might have your own list of friends in comic books. You'd be like Last Gasp out in San Francisco or many other small comic book publishers and distributors out there. You know, you, you, you got to work. You got to talk. The, you know, that's why you have a mouth. If you could talk, use it. I always said, that's what my father used to tell me. You got a mouth, son. Use it. So, and that's what I'm telling you. You have a mouth and you can talk, do it and use it and use your mind, you know. And there's a system in place. But that system it doesn't mean it's always going to be there. You, you can become the system. You can make your own system and make that system work for you. And, you, you know, you got to create your own path. And you got to, you know, have a chance to show potential future advertisers that you have product out there and that you're willing to work hard night and day. And that's the thing about it. This is a night and day job. This is something that you're going to think about. You're going to lose hours of sleep. You're going to keep moving forward. And the one way to, to, to move forward is to create your own infrastructure. And that's the best way of doing that. Create your own infrastructure. Yes, you use what's there to your advantage. But if what's there doesn't, doesn't like your product or is it suitable to you, you then find what's suitable for your business and you keep on pushing and you keep on creating. Because trust me, guys, there will be people that will buy the product from you, even if it's three, four shops, but that will multiply over time. If you keep keep at it, you can't quit. So um, as you create your own channel, also keep their names, get their information, and have that list because that list will become the most valuable thing to you in the long run. On top of that, as you make that, don't be afraid. Be bold. And remember, consume your fear. And sometimes you got to leap into the fire heads first, head first. But I always do that. And it, it might drive people I know crazy, but I, I'm not scared. And I tell you guys, don't be scared. Be bold. Take bold steps. And remember, if you have any questions, hit me up, guys. So peace out. This is Jake Estrada with Indie Originals. Talk to you soon. Bye.